Hello and welcome to this episode of Senior Living. It is middle mid, mid July already. I, I I don't know where the time goes. We uh, I hope everyone had a happy and safe Fourth of July. It's been a great month so far. Um, finally, getting some of those monsoon rains that uh, were you know officially kicked in in June, but we're starting to see them now, and uh, it's been a really big help. Um, fire restrictions are lifted, and uh, there should be some uh, some fun for the rest of the summer. We're still going to see high 90 type, type temperatures, um, which is about normal for the Verde Valley for this time of year, and uh, still some great possibilities for more rain through the rest of the month. Um, very fitting and appropriate. It is National Hot Dog Month. It is National Grilling Month. So get yourself out, outside and grill some hot dogs and then uh, take advantage of National Ice Cream Month and uh, follow up your hot dogs with ice cream. And a lot of other great, great opportunities coming uh, coming around the corner. Um, Clarkdale con con continues its concerts in the park. We have got um, the trips and field trips that Camp Verde, that the Parks and Rec Department at Camp Verde plans, uh, a lot of things going on right here in Cottonwood. Uh, the uh, Cottonwood Clippers swim, invitational swim team meet, which will be um, later in the month of July. All you have to do is get on the event calendar at myradioplace.com and you can check out all of the great activities that are uh, going on throughout the Verde Valley. And um, just in case, it's a very... Um, very mobile community here in the Verde Valley. One of the help things that helps keep it that way for those that may not uh, may choose to not own a car or that have um, other other issues is our transit system here in Cottonwood. And w our guest today is going to tell us a little bit more about how we can take advantage of. Uh, all the transit that is available and how we make the most of it. Thank you, Bruce Morrow. You are the transportation manager for the city of Cottonwood. That's correct. Thanks for joining us. Not a problem. Very simply, uh, as I understand it, it and I, I do not take advantage of the transit system here in Cottonwood, but one of these days I've got to, I, I want to just, I just want to ride around and see how it, how it works. But there are basically two systems that are available to us here in Cottonwood, am I correct? We actually have three different types of service that we provide. We provide the service here in Cottonwood, mm -hmm. in Clarkdale, uh, the red and blue lines mm -hmm. uh, that cover pretty much all of Cottonwood and Clarkdale, uh, part of the Verde Villages uh, out toward uh, Del Rio and in, in that area. Okay. Uh, just past the, Ma the Verde Valley Manor. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Clarkdale side, the red side, red line side, covers all of Clarkdale up to and including Yavapai College. Oh, okay. The other part is the Verde Links. Uh, that's our, what we call the commuter service. Uh, it goes between Cottonwood and Sedona. We make eight trips a day. And it goes, uh, starts at the library and then follows 89A all the way over into Sedona, uh, past Talakapaki, and ends up in uh, Poco Diablo Resort, where we turn around and come back and do it again. Make the return trip. <laughs> exactly. Right. The, um, and the two can be, uh, you, use, you use the word cooperative, so uh, you can use, for instance, the CAT system, which is the Cottonwood Area Transit, right. to get to the library where you would pick up a Lynx, um, Birdie Lynx system bus, which would take you on over to Sedona, right? That's, that's correct. And, and right now we're in the process of, of making the schedules match a little better uh, so, that, so that it's possible to get off of one bus, mm -hmm. one of the red or blue line for CAT, mm -hmm. and hop right onto a Birdie Lynx bus to get over to Sedona. Okay. Um, it's it's taking a little time to to figure out how to mesh all this together, but well, it's, I, it's working. And I'm sure that the demand, um, as the demand increases and and the need for that kind of service exists, it'll make it easier because more people will be taking advantage of it. Well, one of the things that I'm looking at doing this fall, and I hope to have it in place uh, by October 1st, mm -hmm. is a second bus for the Verde Links uh, oh, okay. to to specifically in the morning and the afternoon mm -hmm. to better enable our riders to get over to Sedona. A lot of our riders are, are working in Sedona. Okay. So by adding that second bus for the, the uh, two middle runs in the morning and mm -hmm. the 
two middle runs in the afternoon, it'll give them more opportunities to make sure that they can get to work. And we want to get them home as well. Right. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. So if I lived in the Verde Villages near Del Rio, let's say, would I take two buses then to, if I had classes at Yavapai College? You would have to take two buses. Okay. You, would, you would take the blue line into the library and catch mm -hmm. the red line there. Okay. And the red line will take you up to the college. Oh, okay. That's not that bad. That's pretty pretty simple. It usually takes, if, if you get on in, on Del Rio or anywhere out western mm -hmm. in that area on one of our stops, it mm -hmm. will take you probably about 25 minutes to get to the library get on the red line and then get up to the college. Still not too bad. If the alternative was walking, I think I'd choose the, I think I'd choose the transit system. It seems very affordable to me. Um, when, I, uh, when I've looked at the website and just kind of figured it out, it seems like it would be a very reasonable alternative. I happen to drive a little bit of a gas guzzler. It, I, it seems to me that it might make sense. For a lot of people, it does make sense. Um, I come from Minneapolis, St. Paul in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and our transit there is, is very good. Mm -hmm. um, but for comparing the rates there to the rates here, really isn't fair. Uh, we have a much smaller population, of course. I was gonna say, I think there's a little bit of a different in po size, difference in size and population between us, but, but probably, uh, Probably you got some good ideas from all of that. Well, I did. One of the things that, that I did, they were doing it before, but I improved, well, I consider it, I improved on the pass system that mm -hmm. we have. Uh, if you buy a monthly pass for CAT, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you'll save, if you're riding every day, twice a day, you'll save about 30% by buying the monthly pass as opposed to paying every time you get on the bus. The same is true with riding the Verde Links. We have a monthly pass system for that. If you buy the monthly pass, you'll save about 30%. And then uh, last year I introduced what I call the all access paths. Mm -hmm. it gives you access to any of our buses mm -hmm. anytime during the month for as much as you want uh, for 80 bucks. And you can go anywhere we go. Again, when you think about the cost of driving your own vehicle, sometimes that is a very appealing alternative. And I think that um, you know there are when you're when you're making short runs or just you know picking the bus up at certain bus stops, it makes perfect sense. What uh, you mentioned in October, you planned to um, add a second or hope to add a second uh, Lynx bus. That's correct. What other what other improvements or uh, growth do you expect to see over the next few months? Well, on the on the Lynx run, we're, we're at a point now where we're pretty much at capacity with the buses we have. Okay. Uh, so in order, I have two choices. I can either buy new buses, bigger buses, and keep running the same schedule, or I can add a second bus to uh, help in the overflow mm -hmm. so that it gives the riders more options and uh, will give us a little breathing room for growth. Um, we, we average about 5,200 rides a month uh, on the Lynx system right now. And, you know, we, that is about as many as we can push on those buses and, and make sure everybody has a comfortable seat. Right. You can get all of the schedule information, the fee information is available at the Cottonwood City website, the Transportation uh, Department link. And they do have the schedules for both the red and blue line, the link system. Um, it's all available right there. And if you do have any questions, the contact information has been on the screen. It is again on the website. And I have called uh, the office several times, very willing to help out and give you the answers that you need. Bruce Morrow, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day. I'm, there's lots going on. And uh, we'll, we'll check back in and see when we've got some other buses running. And, and uh, hopefully we'll, have, we'll keep our viewers posted on how they can take advantage of the system. Well, I would really appreciate that. And by all means, call me if you have questions. Perfect. We will take a short break, and we are going to be back right after these messages to get lots more great information.
A full life measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. Welcome back to Senior Living, and we've got another subject that may not affect all of our viewers, but certainly it has affected a, a, a number of them. As things kind of change and we start looking at uh, retirement possibly, how we're going to enjoy the rest of, uh, of our lives, sometimes our home ownership and what to do with our houses becomes an issue. Uh, you know, lots of people downsize, they move into an apartment, they uh, go traveling, they take their motor home and take off and travel across the country. That's one thing that I want to do. But, yeah, but, the, um, but then the, the question of how to handle it, do I sell my home, do I hang on to it, how do I really approach that situation? And while I don't think any one person has all the right answers, we've asked Gary Lund, he's the president of the Sedona Verde Valley Realtors Association. For 2013. For yes. 2013. Yeah. And he is a property manager here in the Verde Valley. And um, I, I asked him to come just talk to us a little bit about some of the things that we might want to consider as we make that decision. First of all, thank you. Thank you. Thanks I, for having me. I really appreciate this. We, there are a lot of things to consider in today's, econo things to consider in today's economic market. Just adds one more little uh, piece to the jigsaw puzzle yes. to try to figure out what to do. And um, just in a nutshell, if if you are, if someone is looking at making their little bit of a lifestyle change and they're going to take their trailer and they're going to travel around the country, what are some of the questions that you think maybe they should ask themselves in determining whether to sell or hang on to their home and rent it out? Well, the biggest thing is probably um, everybody's financial situation is different. Mm -hmm. And it's, it comes down to either a business and financial decision. Can they hang on to the property? Um, if how is the rental market doing? If mm -hmm. we want to rent our property out, what is the mortgage payment? Is that going to cover it? Mm -hmm. Can we afford to make up the difference if it's not going to cover it? Mm -hmm. Do we've got a little egg nest that we can go to if repairs need to be done, if an AC goes out or a hot water tank, things like that. So those are things to consider. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's cut out to be a, a landlord or an income property owner. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and which is good in some ways because it keeps me employed being a property manager <laughs> exactly. um, and handling all those details for them mm -hmm. and taking care of the property. Mm -hmm. yeah. one, one of the things that that I I saw it somewhere, I, I wish I could say I thought of it myself, but I didn't. But sometimes the mortgage minus the rent uh, doesn't necessarily mean your profit or what you're going to make if you decide to rent your house out. If you make, if your mortgage is $800, you rent it for a thousand, you haven't made $200 if you're going to act as your landlord. Sometimes the, the real equation has to factor in repairs and mm -hmm. what, what could happen and how are you really going to find tenants that, you know, how are you going to do all of that? So, I have, I have decided that I'm going to keep the home and I am going to rent it out. Now that I've made that decision, what else do I think of? How else do I think about um, the process of finding renters or making sure that I've got um, resources for right. repairs? Uh, the other thing that's really important, if I am going to be traveling and I'm going to be in a state halfway across the country, do I really want to deal with that? Right, are you up to the day-to-day -day task of managing a property? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where we come in. Um, mm -hmm. As far as we start you know, with tenants and, and the application process, screening tenants, that's mm -hmm. an important part of the business so that we get good qualified people into the home that are gonna take care of the home. Mm -hmm. We do a background check, criminal history check, mm -hmm. also check references and, and employment history, and then go from there. Then you got to be available to do inspections, whether it's a drive-by or interior inspections, mm -hmm. on a regular basis to make sure the property is being taken care of. A lot of things to consider. 
especially if you're going to be an absentee, even if you're local. Mm -hmm. We've got a local, lot of local owners that we manage properties for, but mm -hmm. most of them, if, especially if you're out of state, mm -hmm. really need to consider having a property manager doing that for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And some of those, uh, those processes seem easy enough on the surface, but right. there's a lot. Plus, again, uh, property managers, with very few exceptions, have to be available 24-7. If there's a true emergency at the property, you got to be there. Correct, correct. And we offer that service, too. We've got a 24-hour um, number that our tenants can use in case of an emergency. If it's something serious, like a fire, we tell them, call 911. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't put out fires, right. but we can, we can definitely, if there's things that need to be done, a leak, things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, are, there are a lot of different things to think about, and I, I guess... Again, in the economic market, the first thing, of course, is if I if the rental market doesn't uh, isn't standing up to the amount that I need to cover my mortgage, mm -hmm. it, it, is it worth it for me? I, there's I guess what I'm saying is there's probably a a good point to maybe discuss something with your um, financial resources. Make sure that there's a way that you're going to be able to correct if not make money to use it to your advantage if mm -hmm. you are going to have to take a loss in the rental rate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's a word it's good to know what the market is, mm -hmm. uh, what fair market rents are. Mm -hmm. You want to be competitive in the market. Mm -hmm. We've been the rental market right now is really good and mm -hmm. we're we're renting things fast. Mm -hmm. Rental rates aren't necessarily going as fast as we're renting them. They're not going up. Mm -hmm. We're still economy driven. Mm -hmm. So you got to be priced fairly. Mm -hmm. If a property sits on the market for two, three, four months, that's lost income. Mm -hmm. Waiting for that extra $50 a month because you're priced too Good high. Good point, right. Good yeah, point. so you really want to know what the market's doing. You want to be fair market rent, just mm -hmm. like if you were selling your home. You mm -hmm. know, you want to be a fair market value. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's, that's good advice. There are a lot of different resources out there for you to check, and as we mentioned, um, the, the Sedona Verde Valley Realtors Association is our local mm, club of experts in terms of both mm -hmm. realtors, property managers, um, you're all involved in the market in one way or another. Um, re remember to check with a financial advisor find out where you're sitting, but definitely do your homework. By the same token, you wouldn't want to rent out your house. Um, you, you, your mortgage is 25 years old, and you, you could afford to rent it out for $400, but it's worth $1,200. You no. don't want to do that yeah. either. Yeah, you don't want to be underpriced in the market either. Exactly. Yeah. Not, you know, doesn't have, <laughs> that's not too often, but I do know that the rental market all across Arizona, certainly, and, and across the country is, um, is pretty competitive right now and it's definitely worth checking out. Any last words of advice for our viewers to um, uh, Gary's property management company is Simply Rentals. They are a local company been around for um, as Simply Rentals. It's relatively new about a year now. Since the first of the year and actually mm -hmm. um, my partner Deanne Reber has been in property management since 96 and we actually bought out another property management when we when we started, yeah. That's true. I was going to do something because I know Deanna a little bit. I was going to say she's been around forever. She has. She has, and she's wonderful. Yes, she is. I'm lucky to have her. <laughs> there are a lot of property managers throughout the entire Verde Valley in Sedona. There's a lot of places to get information. Mm -hmm. And uh, we appreciate, Gary, thanks for coming in. We My appreciate pleasure. your time. And um, make sure to do your homework. It's really important to, ch to check all the... T, dot the I's and cross the T's when you're thinking about this. Make sure that if the decision you make is to own a rental property so that you can enjoy life, that you do it the right way. We are going to take another short break. Gary, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. My and pleasure. I hope it wasn't too painful Not for you. Not at all. Thanks, Pat. And we will be back again right after these messages. Stay tuned. Know what? What? Since I got adopted, I've learned a lot about these humans. Uh, I know. I mean, check out these two. It's Flirt City over here. Yeah, I noticed that. It looks like my human is definitely into your human. Oh, look! I think she's getting his number. Nice! Your human's got some sweet moves. Takes after his dog. <laughs> oh, look, they're doing that thing where they put their arms around each other. She kicked up a leg! It's like in the movies! That's awesome. Looks like we're going to be hanging out a little bit more.
Welcome back. We have a special guest in the studio today that um, we are going to get a little bit of information about the Cornville Mission and Food Bank. It has, it's one of the younger ones here in the Verde Valley, but because as we've talked about many times, the needs uh, of our um, Old Town Missions, of, the, of all of the food banks, any of the, the folks that, that help us out, um, sometimes they're a little overwhelming. And I invited the Cornville Mission and Food Bank in to talk a little bit about all the things that they do. As I mentioned, they're a little bit newer. With us, though, is John Wright. You are, have been with the mission for a while. A few years, a few years now. Yes. Thank you for coming in. We really, really appreciate it. Um, tell us just give us just a little bit of the history um, as you know it for the Cornville Mission. Sure. Well, first, I'd like to just thank everybody for all the things that they've done to this point to help us out and get us this far along. That's great. And we just really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Greg Roller and uh, Sandy Cravens uh, started uh, the Cornville Mission Food Bank mm -hmm. uh, a few years back. They started out of the uh, Riverfront Park feeding and then evolved into the Cornville Cornville group. We've moved a couple of times and uh, we're pretty well settled in now to our current facility and uh, uh, we're, we're doing okay. You know, we, we struggle like all the other ministries and uh, for the same funding and mm -hmm. so it's, it's important to us to be good stewards of everything that we do receive from everybody and that they can trust us to do what's right with the money and, and put it in areas that are truly uh, needed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we don't have any paid staff at this point, and so everything that we do get is uh, our full weight of uh, the finances go into just servicing the community. I know I see Greg and Sandy every once in a while out in the community, just uh, sure. uh, if not accepting donations, thanking people, and, and making sure that everybody knows how much they're appreciated, which I think is pretty special. Absolutely, we need to we need to just you know uh, keep hitting on that that uh, the people who are unseen are so important to us mm -hmm. and we're, we're, we're very thankful again for all of them and and of course by name we couldn't possibly go through that list but but mm -hmm. you know who you are and, and we do mm -hmm. appreciate it well thank you what um, what are all of the mm, the focus of the mission right now there's there you accomplish several things every single day that you're open tell us a little bit about all the things that you do well we've tried uh, several things over the years like a lot of the other ministries we put our our feet in the waters of having a, a thrift store and and that uh, financially wasn't uh, probably the best thing to do uh, in retrospect but uh, now we're just focused primarily on just providing food for the truly needy mm -hmm. and uh, we because we have narrowed that we've also uh, lessened our our uh, uh, financial needs mm -hmm. which once again is important especially in these times and so mm -hmm. we're just doing uh, uh, the government TFAP program which is a food box for once a month they can come and get and that's uh, uh, brought to us by St. Mary's and St. Mary's uh, Food Bank out of Phoenix or uh, out of Phoenix also uh, provides uh, fresh produce uh, for us when they have it. Everything's in season, mm -hmm. so there's nothing stored ahead. And a lot of that comes just in the nick of time when it needs right. to be handed out. And so uh, we try not to withhold anything from anyone uh, during those uh, distributions. Uh, but also we have a great number of people that come there. We have around 3,000 a month. Wow. And in, in June of last year, we had 3,700 come through there. And so we see the need is great. And of course, those same people hit other food banks as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the people in Cornville can't uh, quite make it in because of the, the, the gas mm -hmm. or transport, even basic transportation they don't have. Some mm -hmm. people carpool. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just try to offer up whatever is given to us. You know, freely we've received, so freely we give. And uh, we, uh, we don't do any hot meals anymore. Okay, we, we I was do, wondering about that. Yeah, we, because that also costs us a lot more money than we had available mm -hmm. and so we've just really just trying to pay the rent and uh, keep the electricity going and and uh, wait on on whatever comes to us and we're thankful to have that and offer that up as are many of the people that visit the the mission I'm quite sure do you um, I know that again this may be uh, uh, something that you've are not doing currently but I know like on Sundays you used to have some like a, a get-together kind of thing. Right, we did that for quite a while. We had a, a, a Sunday jam and mm -hmm. we had local musicians would come and we would 
have uh, various people cook various things and mm -hmm. but the number of people that showed up just kept decreasing oh, okay. and so once again we we thought our the best use of our resources was mm -hmm. to just put staples out available for the the people could come and make choices themselves on what they wanted and to have and didn't have and we we, we see a lot of uh, young families children uh, single moms uh, that really are just really having a hard time making it right. and so we uh, we actually got to the point now where we just ask everybody for roughly one dollar a month each oh, okay. and they can come uh, Monday Wednesday Friday mm -hmm. and sometimes we're if we're there offloading uh, the, the stuff that we get distributed to mm -hmm. us from St. Mary's we always we never deny them a chance to come in and get right. something right. and we have uh, several uh, bakeries in the area that have been donating to us quite regularly and we're thankful for that and of course the grocery store pulls mm -hmm. uh, we get a portion of that as well good and we're looking also to make uh, meat purchases and so with a uh, very little money we can acquire uh, some of that when it's when it's available right. and we offer that up before we run out of time how can our viewers help what kinds of things do you need well uh, you know we're always looking to be more efficient and so modern uh, freezers and refrigerators will help anytime we can rotate mm -hmm. out an older one and put a newer one in mm -hmm. you know we're better off uh, we could always use volunteers we're, we're trying to uh, encourage uh, some of the older folks who maybe don't have as much on their plate and have uh, uh, vehicles that we could possibly use to go and acquire the food because St. Mary's does distribute to us mm -hmm. but we can also uh, purchase uh, other food mm -hmm. and we have to go after that mm -hmm. uh, you know any kind of uh, exterior or interior light maintenance if someone's sitting around the house and wants something to do they're always welcome to come we want it to be a friendly happy clean place for people to come and, and feel comfortable knowing that they can come and get food without uh, any judgment or or any you know anything adverse you know, they, they, they have enough of that in their life and they need they need to know that we're there for them right a lot of opportunity for the community to help each other. Um, remember that the uh, Cornville Mission, like all the rest of them, it's a 501c3 corporation. Any donations that you make are tax deductible. Your time is greatly appreciated as much as anything. If you know of, know of or own a local um, business that is food related, grocery store, convenience store, and you have stuff that has to be off the shelves, Give them a holler. I'm sure they, they would appreciate it. We would. John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for Best of luck. And uh, for we'll stay in touch. And uh, tell Greg and Sandy we said hello. And uh, we'll, we're pulling for you guys. Thank you for being here. You stay tuned. Uh, check out the messages that will follow this. And we'll be back right after the break. Thanks for calling the GED Pep Talk Center. Jerry Stiller speaking. Your level seven in your face, Pep Talk. I can keep pushing. Believe me, I'm good at it. But at some point, you're going to need to start pushing yourself. See, once you've got your GED diploma, you, you'll feel so good about yourself. You tell them. You can't change your past, but you can definitely change the future. That makes me so happy, I'm ready to bust out a dance. Mr. Trejo, can I transfer this guy to you? My gentle technique isn't really working. You need something a little more... Persuasive. Yes! You listen, and you listen good. Hey, where's my sandwich? Terry? Terry! Take it from me to King DMC. It's a real cool thing to get your GED. Get that diploma! Now hold on and we'll find you free GED classes. Capiche? Whatever motivation you need, we've got a pep talk for you. Get your GED pep talk and find free classes at yourged.org. Welcome back. Along the same lines as our previous guest, Mr. Wright from the Cornville Mission, there are so many opportunities in the Verde Valley for um, all of us to help out fellow, fellow community members. And one has been in the headlines quite frequently over the last few months because we are so fortunate to get to welcome Sergeant Jordan Maynard and his family into our community. Sergeant Maynard is a veteran uh, that was injured and the Homes for Our Troops is building him a specially equipped home to meet the needs of his handicap. And there are so many bits and pieces to this. 
that we don't always think about on a regular basis. Yay, they're building him a home. Yay, he's going to get to join our community. There's a lot more involved to that. And we are joined today by Pam Van Winkle and Mayor Diane Jones, who have both been very involved in this. And they are working to help support the homes for our troops. The, the, the first thing I will start off with is thank you very much for being involved in this. It's a really great honor to have him join our community and to have this, um, this happening right here in our own area. Absolutely. It's, it's, um, I've been following some of the, the soldiers coming back from Afghanistan, many of them quad, quad amputees. Mm -hmm. And um, Sergeant Maynard lost both of his legs mm -hmm. two years ago in March. And so, you know, it's exciting to think that we're having someone, a hero, mm -hmm. moving into our community, as someone who has given so much so that we can get up every day and be free and, and walk around, you know, and, and he's got challenges now because of his service for our freedom. And so we want to do, we and others in the community, we have a group of people mm -hmm. and we're looking for more volunteers to so help out. So many opportunities. There's Absolutely. always opportunities to help out. Well, the one thing that I wanted to focus on for just a minute, if that's okay, the Homes for Our Troops has been providing homes for returning um, injured servicemen. Um, and they have, if I saw right, they built over 100 homes now. And they do remodel some, if I understand correctly. Right, right. If, but usually they build from scratch, but occasionally they said that they do remodel. Right. It's um, the, the projects that they undertake, um, as anyone who has a family member who's handicapped, anytime you have to retrofit your home to accommodate that, there's expense involved. So the, the, the mission that the Homes for Our Troops has taken on is pretty huge. It's very uh, impressive that they've taken this on. One of the things that they ask is not for the service person or their family to pay anything for the home, but for the community to help raise funds so that the next and the next and the next home can be built. Exactly. And all of the money raised in our community will go to Sergeant Maynard's home. But, you know, we're a small community. Mm -hmm. It's not likely that we're going to raise the amount that the house will cost. Right. And it's comforting to know that we'll work very, very hard, you know, because mm -hmm. he deserves that. Mm -hmm. But his house will be built and no matter what. Right. So and, and that those... organization is wonderful for doing right. that. The funds that we raise here in the Verde Valley area are allows Homes for Our Troops to have that much more to, again, to help the next person in the next community. Exactly. So tell us a little bit about there are there are fundraisers planned, and I do um, I, there there's there's a lot of opportunity for our viewers to get all of the details. But tell us a little bit about the fundraising um, opportunities that are coming up. Well, we'll start with the spaghetti supper. We have about three that we've planned, and we want to do more. Of course, we're waiting for the community to give us ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, but Pam has been working diligently on a spaghetti fundraiser. It was thrown in my lap. I just picked up the ball and ran with it. Sometimes that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and Brandy's Kitchen here in Cottonwood has stepped up to the mm -hmm. plate. They're awesome. Mm -hmm. They're uh, donating not only their time, their restaurant, their cooking skills, but the food also. So 100% of the proceeds from the dinner will go to Sergeant Maynard. I'm, I want to interrupt for one second just to give a little bit more introduction to you, Pam. You are with both the, you're with the BFW? The BFW. Okay. I'm the president of the Ladies Auxiliary Ladies, okay. of Post 7400. <laughs> <laughs> and, and many of the, the other um, civic organizations are involved with uh, Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And helping out tremendously as well. We're all working together. Right, right. So the... Um, the American Legion, the Moose Lodge, the VFW, um, and then as you mentioned, there are individuals and then um, mm -hmm. places like Brandy's Kitchen. The, I think it's an honor to be able to be a part of this. Oh, I think absolutely. That's, that's how I feel. An honor that he would choose the Verde Valley, you know, area to want to live here and bring his family. He has a wife 
Jennifer and a small son, uh, eight years old, and so he's, you know, moving his entire family here. And that to me is an honor that he would, he honors us by doing that. On the Homes for Our Troops website, I did read, um, tell us, do you know what made him choose our community? Well, he's actually, you know, he's been in California for two years since his accident, since mm -hmm. he stepped on the IED and lost mm -hmm. both of his legs. He's been in intensive therapy, you know, getting prosthetics, learning to walk again, right. and, and all of the things that go along with that. Um, so, but he lived in Kingman. Oh. And his wife is from Flagstaff. And his mother actually lives in Cornville right now. So I, I think that um, that's probably why he's got family around. And he, he chose a lot outside of Cottonwood. And, and he likes, um, it's, you know, kind of secluded. It's not real busy. It's a place to just live and enjoy his life. And, and yeah. he'll be part of the community. I mean, he's, he's a member of the American Legion in his hometown right now. And so I know he'll, he'll be part of the community. His child will go to school in Cottonwood. And right, so absolutely. So he's just a member of the community. Right, and Homes for Our Troops, um, as, a, as a whole, they, um, one of the things that I read on the website, which I think is important for us to remember, is it's under 10% of the funds that are raised go to the administrative side exactly. of it. Exactly. So 90% of everything that they raise goes directly to assist our veterans that have been injured and help them. And, and you know, when you think about it, the, one of the sad things, I guess, is the best way to describe it, is that they aren't able to help more veterans because so many of our vets come home with physical injuries and disabilities and, and as amputees or, or um, spinal, cord, spinal injury. cord injuries, and head you know, injuries. And nowadays with the, with the medical field, mm -hmm. and they're able to save so many more people than they mm -hmm. were, say, in Vietnam. Right. Many um, young people with these kinds of injuries would not have made it in the Vietnam War. Absolutely. But because of the upgrades in medical care and getting transportation, they're able to get them out of there. In fact, um, the brochure says that Jordan um, on the way to the first medical facility, they actually had to do, uh, I, I don't know the term, but they had to, to massage his heart manually to keep him alive until they could get appropriate medical care. Then that type I mean, of technology so is, is at least there for he him. He is like you know. a miracle. He is, that's you incredible. Know. We don't have as much time as I know that we would all like to have to talk about this, but lots of fundraisers. Um, the the website for um, Homes for Our Troops is H, now I can't, it's okay, been on H, the screen. Okay, um, www.hfotusa.org. US, right. There will be lots of information on MyRadioPlace.com, on the event calendar about the fundraisers that are coming up, and we thank both of you for taking the time first of all, to come in and tell our viewers about it. In closing, what, what is the biggest message that you want our community to understand about Jordan, about Homes for Our Troops? What, what one thing would you like to leave on our minds? Um, just not Jordan and, and this particular, but I think they need to remember all veterans. Um, here, now, then, gone, they're never forgotten when they're gone. But with Jordan, anything that's going on and the fundraising, mm -hmm. try to make it, try to participate. But our vets are, they're and my life. Special. Right, you, you spoke a lot of words in a very short uh, sentence and that is that this is about all of our veterans and the more we help, we're not just helping Sergeant Maynard's family, we're helping all of our vets that are returning home. And I'll, I see that our community will outstretch its arms and just, uh, they'll be there for him, I believe, I, knowing our community. I believe you're right. Thank you, ladies, for joining you're us welcome. and letting everybody know about uh, all these tremendous efforts. Um, again, one more opportunity that you can reach out and help another member of our community and help our community um, show the rest of the country what, we're, what we are capable of. We're going to take another quick break, and hopefully you're going to get to see something that uh, will get you out and about in the community and 
and uh, over to the Montezuma Castle when we return. Stay tuned. When you're out there, there's no telling what you'll find. I see it, I see it! Oh, look at you. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. <laughs> find yours at discovertheforest.org. We've talked a lot over the last few months about the rich history that we can enjoy right here in our very own Verde Valley. None is more significant than our location today, which is Montezuma Castle National Park. We're joined today by park ranger interpreter, um, Case Griffin, and thank you very much for spending a few minutes with us to talk a little bit about this incredible, incredible uh, monument we have right here in our own backyard. I'm glad to do it. Thanks for coming out. Absolutely. The, the, uh, I'm awestruck every, when I come out here, it's just an amazing, amazing uh, feat that this is still standing. Tell us a little bit about the castle. Um, I, it's it's uh, hundreds and hundreds of years old, but give us a little bit of the information on it. Well, Montezuma Castle is one of the oldest cliff dwellings and one of the best preserved cliff dwellings remaining in the United States today. It is uh, at least or approximately 900 years old. We think that the earliest rooms were probably built as early as the 1100s AD. And the fact that it's still 90% original is one of the most amazing things about it. You look up there, you can see it's right in that alcove and because of Arizona's relatively dry climate, it's remained preserved all of these years. It's pretty amazing because it was, uh, you uh, expect that it was built around the 1100s, but and it was in, inhabited for almost 300 years. Exactly right. And, you know, when we say 300 years, that's one thing. But when we compare that to the fact that the United States just celebrated our 237th birthday on July 4th, of course, that kind of gives us a little bit of context. It kind of shows us that this was occupied longer than our nation has been a country. Uh, that's just amazing. And we know that the our, our dwellings that we're currently living in, they're not even going to last anywhere close to that. I don't think we'll see much of them in 900 years. That, good point, good <laughs> point. Um, the National Park, um, it was, bec it became a National Park in 1906. So we've had um, well over 100 years. In fact, uh, there's a huge birthday coming up in a few years that we'll be celebrating here at the park. Right. But the, um, the, the opportunities have changed, obviously. When the, the monument was discovered, the dwelling was discovered in the 1800s, wasn't mm -hmm. it? That's correct. Okay. And so it took a few years for it to um, become a national park before it was truly protected. There was a little bit of scavenging, if you want to call it that, prior to it becoming a park. And now the Park Service has definitely um, taken its responsibility to protect this monument pretty, pretty seriously. Um, we're able to truly enjoy the, the beauty and the significance mm -hmm. without creating any more harm or damage to the area here at the park. Right, right. Um, as um, interpretive park ranger, you have a big responsibility, I think, in educating um, the visitors here. And uh, the park has a lot to offer. Not only is the castle part of the national park, but Montezuma as well. That's correct. Which t uh, dates back to about the same time frame. Montezuma Well was occupied around the same time frame. It's the, the geological feature that's at Montezuma Well, and it is a collapsed sinkhole that we, we think collapsed somewhere around 11,000 years ago. And then by about the same time that Montezuma Castle is occupied, uh, you could think of Montezuma Well as a different town. We gave them the same name today, but really there was no connection prehistorically other than the fact that it was the same cultural group, what archaeologists today call the Sinagua. So here at Montezuma Castle, we had a community that included Montezuma Castle, Castle A, which is a little bit further up the trail, and several other rooms. We think around 250 people total. Over at Montezuma Well, you had several dwellings there today. If you were, go to, if you were to go to Montezuma Well today, you could see a pit house there, right. a Hohokam-style pit house. It's actually, as far as we know, the oldest dwelling on the site. 
It goes back to about 1050 AD. Then you have around between 1100 and 1200, 1300 AD, you have some Sinagua style dwellings, dwellings similar to Montezuma Castle. Um, some one room cliff dwellings as well as uh, collapsed structures including a 12 room Pueblo and a 17 room Pueblo. You've got an irrigation canal that was dug a thousand years ago there and is still being used today by people around the area That's who use amazing. it for their irrigation. <laughs> And then on top of that, you've got another building that's a historic building that was built by the William Back family in the 1800s, or early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And their smokehouse is actually being explored as potentially one of the oldest historic wooden buildings in the state of Arizona. That's so amazing. there's a lot of historic and prehistoric buildings there. Well, we've given our viewers uh, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of the, the education they can learn here at the park. Tell us a little bit about some of the, uh, about the hours, the events. I know that the, you can get into the Montezuma Castle National Park 364 days a year. You close Christmas Day. That's right. Tell us a little bit about the hours, the events, how people can take advantage of this. Well, that's, I think, one of the greatest things about the monument. We're open, as you said, 364 days a year. We're open Monday through Sunday. We don't close on weekends. We're open on almost every holiday of the year. If you had been here on July 4th, our rangers would have been right here to serve you. Um, we open every day from 8 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to do much more than just the programs that we have for people from out of town. We've really started trying to get a lot of programs that will serve everybody, not just folks from out of town, but our local community as well. So back in June, for example, we had the uh, Moonlight Flute Concert. Uh, artist Wolf's Robe was here. Mm -hmm. Montezuma Castle was lit entirely in moonlight. Of course, it was the night of the super moon that we had that. That is awesome. And it was beautiful. And we're planning to do another concert like that in the fall. We haven't pinned down the date yet. Mm -hmm. But we have concerts like that. We have star parties, um, both at Montezuma Well, which our next one will be October 12th. Mm -hmm. um, we usually have one in the springtime over at Tuzigoot National Monument, right. which is our sister park. Right. And then uh, other things that we do, for example, um, earlier this year we had Hubble Trading Post came over and mm -hmm. they brought rugs, Navajo rugs, mm -hmm. um, which was really a neat thing because this site thrived in trade. Mm -hmm. And so even though the Navajo were not at this site prehistorically, mm -hmm. other cultures beside the Sinagua would come to Montezuma Castle and they would trade with the Sinagua culture. So it was neat to continue that tradition of trade. Absolutely. We have basket weavers that will come periodically, mm -hmm. flint nappers, and, and many of the people that come to our, um, our different demonstrations today are from modern tribes whose prehistoric ancestors were affiliated with this place. Right. Much of, many of the Arizona tribes are descendants of what were the, once the Sinawa. We have eight tribes today mm -hmm. that are affiliated with Montezuma Castle National Monument. The Hopi and the Zuni both trace their ancestry, some of the people, specifically to this place. The Yavapai and the Apache say that while they did not actually live inside the castle. They were in this area as hunter-gatherers. Right. And so they mingled with, their ancestors mingled with the ancestors of the people that were here. Uh, and then several of the Otam groups in mm -hmm. southern Arizona say that their ancestors traded with the Sinagua. And so we have eight different groups today that still see this as a very special place. Lots and lots more information that you can get right here at Montezuma Castle National Park. You can get the whole schedule of events at um, nps.gov slash moca, which is the first few letters of Montezuma Castle. Mm -hmm. That's how you can remember it. The entire schedule is on there. Park Ranger Griffings, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Get out here and enjoy it. I will tell you, you've seen some of the shots. There are many photos of the, of the Montezuma's Castle and the well that are absolutely beautiful. Nothing compares to seeing it in real life. So come on out and enjoy our very own rich history. We'll join you right back in the studios after these words.
the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. On the banks of the Verde, where the cottonwoods grow high at the end of the road. A legend lives forever of a rider in the sky and his stories often told. At night you can't hear his hoofbeats loud and clear as he rides all alone in the dark. On the banks of the birdie on a ranch called Blazing M rides a man brave and bold. His guns are loud as thunder and there's lightning in the wind as he searches for his gold. At night you can hear his hoofbeats loud and clear as he rides all alone in the dark. On the banks of the birdie rides a ghost from long ago on a ranch called the Blazing M. On a ranch called the Blazing M. All right. <laughs> Why? Thank Bill you. Bassett, our very own Verde Valley's Bill Bassett is joining us in studio and we so appreciate you being here. That was awesome, by the way. Well, well, thank you, Pam. Thank you very much. I don't know that there's a whole lot of introduction. Many of us know Bill from the Blazing M, um, from his days with the Retros, and now you oh. are out and about again um, with Bill Bassett's Trailblazers. Bill Bassett's Trailblazers. All right. <laughs> so, so, we want to definitely, um, the Blazing M is a, is a landmark, it's a wonderful place, yes, and the, the is. show is very, very incredible. Thank but you. we're not going to talk a whole lot about it, just go out and see it for yourself, that's what you need to do, you just have to go see it. What have you been up to? What have I been up to? I've been trying to get bring country music back to the Verde Valley, and my, uh, my little combo, Bill Bassett's Trailblazers. Uh, we've been working on playing the right kind of songs, the country songs, with the right kind of tempos, the right kind of dance beats, and we're anxious to get people out line dancing and two-stepping and ten-stepping and cotton eye joeing and and shottishing and polkaing and everything you want to do. See, not only is it music and entertaining, <laughs> it's, it's exercise. It's exercise it's too, get us up off and it's our a good time. Yeah, it's a good time. Sounds great. Um, you know, I know there's been a couple of places you um, have made a few appearances at mm -hmm. the main stage here lately. Tell us, um, you know, keeping in mind that some of our viewers won't necessarily watch before this weekend, but what are some of the things well, you've got sure. coming up? Well, fortunately, uh, you mentioned the main stage. That's a, a wonderful new venue right at the corner of Mingus and Maine and Cottonwood. And the energetic young people who have taken that building over and made it something that's really special. I'm just absolutely thrilled to, uh, to have been invited to be part of that. But we're going to start on Sunday afternoons uh, in an ongoing basis uh, at 4 o'clock Sunday afternoon and we're going to start playing real country music there and hopefully invite members of the community out. They, I'm, I'm uh, uh, just so excited that we're going to finally have some place where we can do this consistently and hopefully build a following, get people out to enjoy the music. I know I was pretty, um, I, I tend to be a, more of a country music fan, uh, uh, not totally, but <laughs> more, but it was, it kind of warmed my heart when I heard him, that, that they said, we've gotten too many requests, we've got to have a country music Sunday, it's got to happen. Got to have a country music Sunday. Well, and they do such wonderful other, other nights of the week. I mean, uh, their first Friday is an mm -hmm. art gallery presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, other nights, alternative rock bands, uh, groups you might not have heard of that, that deserve a listening to. Yeah. It, every night is a different event, um, and every one of them is exciting, and, yeah. and it's just a thrilling opportunity. I, um, I would have to agree. Um, so that's on Sunday. Mm -hmm. What do you do with the rest of your time besides oh. be at the Blazing M? <laughs> Well, gosh, I'm, I'm very much a couch potato. Oh, <laughs> no, but I, you're up all night playing music. No, yeah, hardly all music. night, but um, no, I, I, I work on, on music at home. I uh, um, 
I'm active in online social media. Woohoo! <laughs> I've seen your Facebook posts. <laughs> You've seen my Facebook posts, yes. Well, well I yeah. think that um, there's, a, there's a lot going on and we'll definitely um, keep in mind where you're going to be when you've got your next um, thing coming up that. and uh, again uh, Blazon M is always a great place to go see this man's talent along with the rest of the Blazon M Cowboys they're oh, awesome. They are uh, Jim Martin, Jeannie Martin uh, we are so blessed to have them here. They came out here a few years ago from New Mexico to join We've us. We've actually been blessed to have them on the show oh, um, yeah. last year too. It was awesome. And they are they are dynamite. Um, you just couldn't ask for better entertainment. I'm again just honored to be part of that whole show. I've been there over eight years now. And you're an old timer. I'm an old timer now. So. <laughs> <laughs> but everything from the the food, the hospitality, the staff, the the uh, attractions, the the activities, uh, every one of them is so well done. Yeah, and, and so it's I, I do I try to remind our viewers often that um, sometimes places like the Blaze and M are considered. Um, oh, when when we have company come in or we'll take right. the family. The truth is, you need to get out there and enjoy it. It's one of our great great local attractions, and it's all well worth it. Um, so again, we're we're not going to spill the beans about the show too much. <laughs> um, if you haven't seen it. Uh, or haven't seen it in a while, you need to get out and check it out. Stay um, in touch with Bill Bassett on his Facebook page. You can friend yeah. Bill Bassett's Trailblazers That's on right. Facebook. That's right. Uh, if I may, a, a couple of other Please. events. On uh, August 2nd, Friday mm -hmm. night, August 2nd, mm -hmm. the Blazing M Ranch is hosting a fundraiser for the for the Granite Mountain Hotshot, mm -hmm. which are the families of the, uh, of the mm -hmm. tragic, tragic loss of the uh, firefighters in Prescott. Right. And That'll be from six o'clock on uh, mm -hmm. on August second, Friday night. Okay. And every everything is donated to the families. Perfect. Uh, tickets are only twenty five dollars, and you can get them at a variety of places around the Verde Valley. Certainly at the Blaze and M Ranch. Right. All that information is available online. Online, yes, it is. Blazeandm okay. com. All right. What else you got? Well, let's just see. Oh, there's a there's a uh, another of the murder mysteries. Um, oh, I saw at the that Blaze and one's M coming Ranch. up. So you may want to check the web page on that one too. Um, I believe Absolutely. that's August 9th. I think I think you're right. So you can get all the information that you need either on um, Bill Bassett's Trailblazers Facebook page, that's the right. Blaze and M Ranch, as always at myradioplace.com. We have all of that stuff on our event calendar. And uh, we want to remind you to check all that out, remind you to check out uh, some of the places that we've been able to visit uh, about today. And with that having been said, thanks for joining us. And we want to listen to a little bit more of Bill Bassett's wonderful, I want to say cowboy music, but maybe this you're is, not going to, okay? This is a terrific cowboy song, one of the best cowboy songs ever written, My Home in Arizona. I got a new pair of denims with the bright yellow stitching and the red copper rivets on the seas. I got a 10-gallon Stetson full of $10 notions and a $10 bill inside my jeans. So get out of my way, let me buy. I'm a long way from my home in Arizona, Arizona. Spending many a day on the trail since I left that gal back home in Arizona, Arizona. I remember her eyes like the lonely desert skies when she promised she'd wait just for me. So I'm hitting the trail, gonna ride till I see the lights of home in Arizona, Arizona. Thank you.